Welcome to the County Seat. I'm your host, Chad Booth. We are wrapping up our series of one-on-one -on -one conversations with people running for the U.S. Senate. Our final guest is uh, Mitt Romney, uh, who is a former governor of Massachusetts. Very nice to have you here on the show. Thanks, Chad. Good to be with you. So there are a lot of issues, uh, and, and there's a, a lot of concern that keep coming up. And Utah, one of the primary areas that gets a lot of conversation is immigration. Just today, in the paper, it was announced that uh, there is a Utah being considered for uh, Deputy Secretary of State, and he has a, a pretty strong immigration stance. But Utah as a state has very mixed feelings about immigration. As a U.S. Senator, what would be your stance on immigration and what we should do about it? Well, first of all, I think we all can agree it's a mess, and we need to simplify and make far more transparent the process of becoming a legal immigrant Legal immigration is a good thing for the country. That's part one. Part two, illegal immigration, we've got to stop. And so a, a physical barrier on our southern border makes sense, but that's uh, necessary but not sufficient. We have to also vigorously use our e-verify system, which allows employers to know who's here legally and who's not. And if someone is here illegally and an employer hires them, we sanction the employer. When that happens, Employer, uh, employers are not going to hire illegals. They're not going to get work here. They're going to go home on their own. Those, those are two critical elements. One more thing I'll mention, and that is we need temporary workers in the agricultural area. Uh, if you will, visa holders for agricultural harvest and, and in, with regards to dairy, we need them uh, year long. And my own view is instead of the federal government deciding how many of these agricultural visas to have and then doling them out as they see fit, each state should be able to say, here's how many we want. The state should be able to contact their various agricultural uh, employers, say, how many do you need? The state should say, this is the number we want, and then the federal government should provide those to the state so those people can come in. We shouldn't have to have people that are growing uh, uh, crops here in Utah wonder whether or not they're going to be able to get workers to harvest the crop. That's true, and it, and it is a very big part of, of rural Utah's labor force, and I'm not sure how often people actually realize that. Uh, there are three basic areas of, uh, that we'd like to cover, and these are all questions that have come to us from county leaders and people across the state, both urban and uh, rural. And they are in the areas of uh, regulation, uh, long-term issues, and opportunities. And so I'd like to kind of just glance over the regulations, and, and one of them we were actually discussing briefly just before the show, and that is the wilderness study areas. Utah has more temporary wilderness study areas that have been temporarily in place for three and a half plus decades than we actually do wilderness areas. It's up to Congress to make that final determination. Uh, what efforts do you think should be happening at the, at the end of uh, Washington, D.C. on this issue? Well, I think the bureaucrats looked and said, gosh, Congress gets to designate a wilderness area that removes multiple use. Uh, and and uh, and so they said, gosh, we don't like the fact that Congress can do that. Why don't we find a way to do it? And so the bureaucrats said, we're going to have a wilderness study area, and we're going to keep those in place for decades, as you point out. I mean, it makes no sense at all. We have 3.2 million acres under wilderness study area. In my view, th those wilderness study areas should continue to have multiple use as they had in the past while they're being studied. There's no reason to stop multiple use while the study's going on. And if the BLM wants to study, let them study. But until Congress designates something as a wilderness area, it should be open for multiple use. And, uh, and I, I think we just have to make it very clear. It may require legislation uh, to make sure that we do not allow the bureaucrats to de designate large tracts of land as study area and then keep people from being able to use it. Do you think it would be that hard for, for a, a motivated um, contingent of representatives in Washington from the western states just to push their uh, colleagues in the eastern part of the United States to end this whole thing, to either say, make it wilderness or not? After yeah. three decades, we should have it studied, should we not? Yeah, in my view, uh, we have to get the representatives and the senators from the western states where public land is a huge issue from the western states together and say, okay guys, what can we all agree on? And my sense is if we could get the western states to agree on things like the Antiquities Act, the Endangered Species Act, uh, wilderness uh, designations, if we can come together on those things, we can present legislation that clarifies and allows local involvement and state involvement in these decisions as opposed to having the bureaucrats have a stranglehold on public lands. 
So that kind of leads to a broader issue, and that is the, the status of multiple use. Do you think the public lands in Utah are fairly represented in multiple use? Well, some yes and some no. I mean, th those that are under wilderness study area, 3.2 million acres, we don't have multiple use. And that's a problem. That should be changed. Uh, likewise, when you have a president, whether it was Obama or Clinton, that stepped in and said, we're going to take public lands and designate this as a <coughs> national monument, uh, again, over 3 million acres, uh, that's not appropriate. I, I support what Lisa Murkowski of Alaska has proposed, which is saying before a president can take huge tracts of land like that, he or she has to get the approval of the local state legislature. So we really need to change the way that the bureaucracy in Washington inserts itself into multiple use on our lands here in Utah. I mean, we've got two-thirds of our state is public land, all right, and, uh, and the federal government shouldn't be controlling that. I'd like to see it all become state land. Uh, but in the interim, let's have far more uh, local involvement. And I know the eastern states don't think about this much. I mean, I, you know, I, I ran for president, as you know, spent a lot of time in Iowa. I, I looked it up, 0.3% uh, of Iowa is public land, all right? So they don't care about this so much. It's like, okay, guys, if two-thirds of your state were public land, you'd probably have some concerns, too. I think if the western state leaders come together, uh, Republicans and Democrats, we can get our colleagues in the eastern states to say, yeah, okay, you guys know this better than we. Rob Bishop has been pushing for a long time to try and educate legislators that this is costing them a lot of money, in, in excess of $9 billion a year just to... Uh, maintain all this land that doesn't turn any money for the U.S. Treasury. Uh, do you think there needs to be more voices on that uh, on that bandwagon? Yeah, I think it's great for us to fight for the, the principles that we have in this regard. I think we have to link arms with some people in other states who have the same concerns. And I know there are some Democrats in some of those states, uh, particularly in the rural parts of California, for instance, Democrats, Republicans. If we can get all of us together on some of these things, then I think we're going to be able to get the people in the eastern states who don't really care that much one way or the other to say, okay, you guys, Republicans, Democrats agree on this. We'll work with you on it. All right. That's a good, that, that's a good solution. Endangered Species Act. Over the last 10 years, this is, uh, as some people say, it's become weaponized to help promote wilderness and a shift from multiple use, a sustained yield to a single use or single purpose, as in protectionism, and that they're using endangered species to put, push traditional users out of the West. Uh, do we need to relook at the Endangered Species Act? Yeah, I'd like to reform it. And the, the expert on this, uh, locally, of course, is Rob Bishop who for some time has been promoting either elimination of the Endangered Species Act or reform of the act. Uh, it, we've had uh, only 2% of the species that have put on the act as endangered have ever come off. So it's obviously not working. What it is being used for is, as you point out, a weapon by the, uh, the bar, if you will, the, the, the environmental bar to, to uh, have plenty of income for themselves and lots to talk about and lots to raise money off of, but it's not very rarely being used actually for the purpose that it was intended. I mean, we, we have this provision known as EJA, as you know, which is the Equal Access to Justice Act, which says if a private law firm or individual sues the government or sues on behalf of the government, and if they win and they only have to settle for one dollar, then all the law firm's billings get reimbursed by the federal government. Well, you've got all sorts of law firms that are making a huge killing off of bringing all these lawsuits, having a settlement from a compliant Washington, D.C. who settles with them. They don't even have to go to court. They just settle with them. Now they get all their fees. Look, this, this has got to change. The, the bureaucrats won't even tell us how much money they're paying out to these law firms and what the settlements are. And th this at least has to be transparent. But I think we also have to reform the act and reform the Endangered Species Act at the same time uh, to, to make sure that we we're actually fulfilling the, the, the intent of these pieces of legislation, and they're not being used as a way to pilfer from the federal coffers. Well, uh, in 2013, I believe the Sierra Club received $13 million of EJ reimbursement, and that number is really hard to come by because of Senator McCain's uh, Paperwork Reduction Act took out the requirement for any reporting to be done, so supposedly they don't even know how much they're giving out in these settlements. Well, wouldn't it be nice if we, we knew how much money we're actually being charged for some of these things? And, and, and this goes on with other federal programs as well. But, but with all the federal lands that we have, uh, these public lands are subject to all sorts of lawsuits by extremists who, who may or may not have a good purpose, but one purpose we know is to make money for themselves. 
and, and that makes it very difficult for us to have confidence in our use of public lands and whether it's a rancher that wants to graze on the public lands or someone who wants to hunt and fish or just go along a road in a, in, in a public area. Th these things are all constrained by the types of bureaucracy uh, limits that you're seeing. So you've had an opportunity to get out fairly extensively in rural Utah and, and uh, grasp these issues. I, I see reports of you showing up in practically every little diner in, in town. <laughs> Uh, now that you've gotten to know Utah's ranchers, do you do you consider them welfare ranchers? <laughs> no, people are working hard to make a living, and uh, and the uncertainty associated with with federal bureaucracies is one of the things that makes it even harder for them to make a living. And and you are right. I've been to 29 counties, all 29 counties, and in each county, I've sat down and had a meal with the county commissioners. Oftentimes, met with uh, with ranchers and farmers and others that are interested in public lands, and said, "Okay, what can we do to make things better for you?" And they're, in many cases, they're really hurting, and and the hurt is not that that they don't like a particular decision. What they don't like is the lack of decision, the fact that the bureaucrats oftentimes just sort of kick the can down the the road, don't take any action, and and as a result, they can't make plans for how many cattle they're going to put on a piece of land or whether they'll be able to use it in the future. So there are two long-term policies that affect rural Utah, and they've, they've been around for, for years. I'm just going to toss both of those topics out. I'm going to let you travel where you will with them. One of them is the wild horse population, which is, um, by best estimates, 40,000 head over its manageable, 45,000 over its manageable limit. Mm -hmm. And then the other is, is relations with some of the tribes and the conflicts with counties and states over some resource issues out there. You take that where you want to go, but uh, I, th I thought you should have an opportunity to address that. Well, the first of those uh, may require legislative fix, and I think we have an idea what kind of legislative fix would be required, which is Congress has said that the BLM can't manage the wild horse population. They've said you can't touch them, all right? They're sacrosanct. Well, you've got, what, 74,000 wild horses, and we should have more like 26,000. And, and they're, uh, of course, taking over the, uh, the, the grazing areas, they're mudding up the, the water holes, uh, and uh, in many respects, these are not wild horses at all. You've got the federal government paying people to put them in corrals and feed them. And the federal government is sp spending almost $50 million a year to feed horses in corrals. They're calling wild horses. They're not wild at all. Not if they're in corrals. This is, this is absolutely ridiculous. And many of them are, are pinto. And it's like, okay, pinto doesn't show up in the wild. This, these are obviously feral horses that have been let out in the, uh, in the pasture by someone who didn't want their horse anymore. Uh, look, this is a real problem. And we've got to say, uh, take off the restriction and say to the BLM, you have responsibility to bring the wild horse population down to an area that is sustainable. There, there are some very unpopular um, areas that, that that wanders into, but it's the same with forest management. It's the same with range management. We've we've developed a mentality that the federal government that that nobody should make money in relationship with the federal government. So therefore, we can't allow you to commercially log. We can't allow the BLM to actually um, sell off uh, wild horses as a livestock product to help control the numbers on the herd. There, there are opportunities to be commercially interfaced to help the United States Treasury, but we seem to be unwilling to do it on any of those issues. What's your take on that? I mean, you're a business kind of guy. Well, I, I think you really ought to let the BLM say, uh, determine what's the best way to bring the horse population down to a level that's sustainable, uh, that can maintain uh, the, uh, the grass that we need to be able to feed our livestock and can maintain the water holes that we need uh, to make sure that wildlife of all kinds is, is able to survive. Uh, and, and whether that requires, whether that allows uh, selling or euthanasia or sterilization, or I mean, they will be able to manage in the way they think best to be able to bring the herd down to an appropriate level. But, uh, but this prohibition, uh, you know, I, my wife is a horse nut. I mean, she loves horses. And when I take her out and I show her, here are the horses that are supposedly wild. And there they are in this big corral, mud. No, there's no grass there, just mud. And they're being fed out of the back of a truck every day. And we're paying money for this to happen. It, that breaks your heart. Like, this is simply wrong. And, and, and if you have a heart, it's not like these horses running through the beautiful grasses. That's not what's going on. These horses are being kept in corrals uh, to try and satisfy some people who really don't understand what's going on in Utah. Excellent. I've talked way too long. We've got to take a commercial break. We'll be right back with the county seat.
For seven years, Utah's Community Voice has been the county seat, a program that looks beyond politics to spotlight the issues and stories that really matter to you and your community. Now you can help set Utah's agenda for the future by joining the conversation. Become a county seat sponsor and help support those conversations that are critical to the future of state government. Contact us at 801-947-8888 to make your contribution to help the voice of Utah be heard like never before. If you're looking for gold at the end of the rainbow, you'll probably be disappointed because in Paiute County, the only thing you'll find at the end of a rainy day is the promise of adventure. Highway 89 is your access point through Marysville and the historic trails of Bullion Canyon. Find yourself in the mountains one minute and the desert the next as you follow in the footsteps of the pioneers. Whitewater raft, fish, hike, all within a few minutes of a comfortable bed and a warm meal. Find out why the world has made Paiute County its off-road destination. Paiute County, the place where the rainbow ends. Too often we find ourselves in shoes like these, or these. Wouldn't it be nice to change into something more like this, or this? How about these? Put on whatever shoes you prefer and come to Beaver County. We have exactly the adventure you need to put under them. So the next time you want to change out of these, come to Beaver County where you can jump into a pair of these. Beaver County, Utah, lace up for adventure. What would you do with an extra day in Utah Valley? Explore the Wasatch Mountains? Snap a family photo at Bridal Veil Falls. Cool off on Utah Lake or the Provo River. No matter what you're searching for, you can find it in Utah Valley. Bring everyone together. Welcome back to the county seat. We are talking with Mitt Romney, who is a candidate for the United States Senate, who has a very well-established uh, political career uh, across the country, ran for president. Uh, I do want to turn my attention to opportunities, okay? Two areas. One of them uh, is the economic uh, development opportunity in rural Utah. What would you as a senator do to help that? Well, first, we got to deal with public lands because in much of rural Utah, 90 plus percent of the county is public land. So we have to deal with that. And we need to have a more fair uh, series of PILT payments, all right, payment in lieu of taxes. Uh, th this, is, uh, this is essential to making our lands work for us. But that's, that's part one. Part two is we have to find ways to get more employers to come into some of the more rural parts of our state. And, and one of the ideas that the Utah legislature came up with and put in place this, this year, actually, this term, is a pretty good one, which is saying we're gonna pay employers in the Wasatch Front a certain amount per head, like $5,000 per person for everyone they hire that lives in one of these rural communities that can then work online for that enterprise. That allows people to stay in rural Utah but have a job along the Wasatch Front without traveling there. That's a good idea. And then we've got federal and state offices. They want to build new buildings for tax collection and so forth. Why did they build them on the Wasatch Front? They should be building them out in rural Utah making sure that in some cases people that are overseeing public lands actually live near those public lands. And I'll mention one more thing, and that is colleges and universities oftentimes have remote campuses all over the state. We have dozens of them. 
those institutions should be seen as a focal point for business development, for new business creation. Faculty and students ought to be able to go to an office there with an idea and say, how can we get this idea into the commercial marketplace? That's happened at Canab, for instance. I'm down at Canab, I see someone that comes up with the idea for something called Stampin' Up, and they employ 75 people in a factory there. Creating new businesses in rural communities is one of the best ways to get good jobs there. Excellent. Um, along that line, uh, what about exports? Well, Utah's a net export state, and I want to see more markets opened, particularly for agricultural products. And that means uh, we need to have a kind of relationship with Mexico that allows us to sell it to Mexico and into Canada. I wanted TPP, which is the, um, the eastern nations, uh, it doesn't ex include China, but the other nations of Southeast Asia, to, be, uh, to become part of a trading block with us so that we can sell agricultural products there. Opening new markets for American goods is good for the Utah farmer and something I support. Should coal be part of that mix? Uh, coal is part of that mix. I, I just saw that Oakland has, uh, uh, courts in Oakland have said, okay, you can't block coal from being shipped out of, uh, out of the Oakland port. Uh, that's a good thing uh, for those in Carbon County and those across the state that are planning on shipping goods around the world. Uh, the, the Oakland, California port should be open to us. Excellent. All right, we're going to take another quick break. When we come back, I, I want to learn about the Romney policy, and we'll talk about some of the key issues and see what uh, the, his take is on that. We'll be right back with the county seat. There's a little place on a Utah map where I was raised, where my heart's at, where the sagebrush grows wild and high, and the stars come out at night. With the youth reservation, skin starvation, that Duchesne County life. Look south to adventure. Look south to beauty. Look south to San Juan County. Out here, the road goes on forever, and what you'll find will change how you see the world. Climb on your OHV and discover forgotten landscapes and vistas that challenge the imagination. From Blanding and Monticello to the cliff faces of Monument Valley, we're open and ready for you to explore. San Juan County, Utah's Canyon Country. 149 million years in the making, dinosaurs once roamed this land. Now they're found at the Dinosaur National Monument. Let's take you beyond the bones. We call it Dinosaur Land. You'll find it offers adventures and sights not seen anywhere else in the world. Come to Dinosaur Land, Vernal, Utah. You'll want to stay forever. The dinosaurs did. place that is beyond words. There is nothing to be said, except take your time in Bryce Canyon country. Planning your next conference or corporate event, the Davis Conference Center offers 70,000 square feet of flexible meeting and exhibit space, plus high-tech audio-visual services that will make your event a success. Whether you're planning a training, meeting, company retreat, wedding, or large convention, let the staff at the Davis Conference Center help you arrange your next event. Located east of I-15 in Layton, call 801-416-8888 or visit davisconferencecenter.com today. The Utah Farm Bureau began as a collection of farmers supporting each other to raise the food we enjoy. Today, Farm Bureau membership encompasses everyone, whether ranchers, growers, or just everyday folks like you and me. Members enjoy discounts on items like vehicles and ATVs, or insurance that's very affordable. You don't have to be a farmer to join, and dues are small, but together we make a big difference in keeping our food supply local and abundant. Join Utah Farm Bureau. Welcome back to the county seat. We're having a discussion with Mitt Romney, who hopefully by his best guesses will become the next U.S. Senator from the state of Utah. I want to talk about Romney policy for a minute. Uh, 
there are three areas that I think are important policy, transportation, energy, and water, and they all have an interface with the federal government. What would the Romney policy look like? Yeah, well, on all these things, the federal government has too heavy a hand. And, and I like to get the federal government out and get control back to localities and to the state. So with regards to transportation, I'd keep the gas tax. Instead of it going to Washington and then they dole it back to us as they see fit, you ought to stay right here. We ought to be able to have our own plans for our own highways. We can manage our highways and build highways for a fraction of the cost that the federal government can. With regards to energy, I'm an all of the above guy which is let the marketplace carry out uh, what it does best, uh, coal, oil, gas, uh, renewable, solar. I mean, all of these are fine, and, uh, and I will fight to make sure that we have uh, a level playing field among those different, uh, those different areas. You had another area as well. Uh, water policy. Water policy. Uh, there will be some who, who think the federal government should take over Utah's water rights and tell Utah uh, whether or not uh, the, the water that's on some of federal lands can be used for grazing. That's, anytime the federal government wants more power over our state, uh, that's a mistake. And I will stand up for Utah's water rights. And in that regard, by the way, with regards to Washington County and the growth that we have uh, in that part of our state, we need to have uh, that pipeline that comes from uh, Lake Powell into St. George. Look, we gotta get all the water that is by agreement ours. And, and not send it off to our friends in California. Um, we've got an agreement, let's take, care, take full advantage of the water that we have. Jerry Brown, so I can be real happy to hear you say that. Sorry, Jerry, you can't have our water. Uh, <laughs> Californians want a lot of our stuff, but they ain't gonna get our water. <clears throat> One final question for you, and, and this has been a question that I've asked of other people who are running for the office. There is a, there's a line that you have to walk between what you stand for, your principle, and what is pragmatic. And I've often related that if Ronald Reagan were to be vo elected on his record as president for what he accomplished, which many think are great things, he probably wouldn't get elected by the very people who make him his champion. Where do you draw that line between principle and pragmatism to get stuff done? Well, you don't compromise principle. Uh, but for instance, if you have um, uh, a tax rate of 50%, and I wanted it at 10%, let's say, and someone said, well, okay, well, we'll get it down to 25. Will you go along with that? Well, if my choice is either keeping it at 50 or getting it down to 25, I'll go for 25. So that's practical and principle. But there are some things you just say, no, I just can't move on. And, and whether that's life, the issue of life, or whether it's a, a federal control of major parts of our life, protection of our constitutional rights, there's no compromise on constitutional rights. Okay, very good. Well, we thank you for taking the time to join us. We thank you for taking the time to tune in. We invite you to share this on social media. We'd love to hear your feedback, uh, and I'm sure that uh, uh, Mr. Romney would also love to hear your thoughts as well on our social media pages and remind you that your ballot should just about now be in the mail and you've got just enough time to uh, get them filled out and back in. Remember, county life is really important to you. It's where your life happens. So participate in the county seat. We'll see you next week.